Hi, this is Daniel, and you're watching Unrivaled Investing. Another day, another SPAC, another interesting deal for shareholders or potential shareholders to look into. Today, we're going to talk about Churchill Corp. The ticker is CCXX, and they are merging with Multiplan. The question is, is this a good deal? It's a deal that's been cooked up by several private equity folks. So is this is this something with a good... That good financial and you know engineering, you can you can smell that financial engineering cooking. You know, like, hmm, am I going to get some juicy returns, or is this going to be something where a deal needs more lipstick, or is or is the investment banker say, you know, this pig needs more lipstick? Let's dig in. So the purpose of this video, we're looking at Churchill Capital. It's a SPAC. If you haven't heard what a SPAC is, I'll get into that in one second. Ticker is C C X X. We're looking at the company that they're merging with, they're merging with Multiplan. What's their business model? What's their history? And what's the opportunity? Can shareholders get that 10X? I'm looking, you know, here at the Unrivaled Investing Channel, I'm looking for big game, baby. I want things that can go up hundreds or even thousands of percent. So you need to be able to pencil out 10X potential. You know, you need to be able to at least think about that when you're looking at these companies. So that's that's a filter that one of the filters I use when I'm looking at investing. That's that's one of the key elements that we're going to bring about in this video. But before digging in, if you like learning about potential multibaggers, you know, those companies that can potentially go up hundreds or even thousands of percent, make sure you're a subscriber to this channel. If you're already a subscriber, hit that like button. And if you want to know what I'm personally doing, what am I buying? What am I selling? What am I holding? You can't take these shares away from me. You know, I'll tell I'll give you the, the analysis of why. You go to un, unrivaledinvesting.com, click on journey, and that's, you know, honestly, that's a way of seeing what I'm doing month to month. And the reality is all it takes is one potential multibagger to change your potential life journey. And so if you're interested in finding those multibaggers, you can follow my journey to find them by going to unrivaledinvesting.com, click on that journey. Also, I love it when you post questions, when you're like, hey, you know, Daniel, take take a look at this company or what are your thoughts on this? So for, for Journey subscribers, I have exclusive content where I go into some of these questions. But for others that are like, hey, take a look at this company, I'm happy to do so. As a matter of fact, today's company, CCXX, Churchill Capital, Multiplan, the merger, the whole deal. This is because Zeppi asked me about it originally. And before that, I, I, I think it was Zeppi and then maybe Lon. You know what? A bunch of people asked me about it. So here it is. I'm doing it for you, my loyal YouTube subscribers. So there's a company you wanna look at, let's do it, let's get this done. Let's, companies, let's knock them out. So what is Churchill Capital? CCXX stands for Churchill Capital 3, not to be mistaken for CCX, which I believe is Churchill Capital 2. So this is Churchill Capital 3. They have $1.1 $1 billion, the pile of cash, just looking for a deal, and they're a SPAC. So that's what SPACs are. They start off as a pile of cash where you're trusting them to be like, go find me a deal. And then you get paid handsomely. You get maybe you get a you know a couple percent of the company for free, effectively, for coordinating, hey, financing and finding this company. That's that's the upside for the SPAC owners. Not only not only did you raise the capital, but now you get you know a couple percent of this company for for, for pretty cheap. Um, so that's they're incentivized to do a deal. You gotta know that with every SPAC you're looking at. But you should also consider, like, what are the pros and cons of a SPAC? Pros and cons of one, it's a lot easier for companies to raise money um, because at the end of the day, you're looking at pretty much one gatekeeper. You're looking at whoever's running the SPAC and be like, please, I got this great deal. Why don't you invest in me? And boom, you get a deal. The SPAC owner gets it. You know, you have to get the approval of the SPAC shareholders. But assuming that goes through, you know, you, you, can, you can then own a chunk of a company. They merge these SPACs, which are publicly traded, get piles of cash. They merge with private companies generally, and they get like, let's say 20% of a company, 40% of a company. They buy a percentage of the company and they, they effectively bring it public by default because then they own a percentage of that company. And now you can trade, you can trade pieces of that company for sale. So the downside to SPACs is it's easier for crap companies to come public because there are fewer gatekeepers. You don't have this IPO process of like, hey, we're going to have this detailed S1. You're going to see all the risks. Instead, you get a fancy presentation done by some bankers that are being compensated nicely. And uh, you know what, what ends up happening is that it's easier for crap companies to go public. So that's, that's the risk. So you, you really have to use, you know, put that thinking cap on when you're sizing up 
you know, those companies that are becoming publicly traded through this back route. So what's the deal here? What is Churchill Capital 3 doing with multiplan? Like what, what's going on? So that, you know, on a high level basis, like cash in, cash out, like what's what's going in? So you have the cash from the SPAC, which is 1.1 billion. Then you have another 1.3 billion coordinated with, you know, effectively friends of the SPAC or existing SPAC shareholders saying like, hey, we need to put in another $1.3 billion of this deal. And then to make this deal work, we're going to raise another $1.3 billion. You don't have to shoulder that. You know who's going to be who's going to be holding that is it's going to be a convertible bond, convertible note that's we're yeah we're issuing it. So someone someone needs to invest in it. But who's the person who's going to shoulder that responsibility? That's going to be the company. That's going to be multi-plan. And they're 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 issuing a convertible bond, $1.3 billion, $13 a conversion price at a six percent interest rate. 7% payment in kind. So that means you don't you you can elect to be like, hey, you know what? I don't want to pay that 6%. Instead, let's let's let it compound at 7%. Um that would be an amazing deal if people could get that to those sorts of rates, but you know, with you with credit cards you get like 20%, 30%. Uh, interest rates here it is 7% and you get to roll it over. Um so that's that's the company issuing that so all in around 3.7 billion dollars going into this deal, new cash infusion going in. What's what's happening with this deal? So you have $1.2 billion debt repayment. You got some expensive debt, eight and a half percent getting repaid. Look, we're in an interest rate environment of zero, pretty much. So anytime you see something like eight, nine, ten percent, you're like, what type of company is this? You're either a crappy company or you have too much debt. Um, we'll, we'll get into that in a second. Next, you can see that they have that there's a nearly a billion dollars in cash going on the balance sheet, 900 million. Then, you know, of course, the machine, you can't break the machine, don't break the wheel, it's still spinning. Because the bankers need to get their $140 million. And so you got that aspect as well. But yeah, I, I, I just ran through a bunch of numbers like $3.7 billion coming in, $1.2 billion for debt repayment, which, by the way, it should ring a bell like, wait a second. Daniel just said we're raising $1.3 billion that the company Multiplans can be issuing and they're repaying $1.2. Er, this isn't just a SPAC deal. This is a debt refinancing. Like that, they, didn't, they don't articulate that in the presentation for all existing you know, shareholders. But you should know this is this is a way of taking a company that has debt and saying, hey, we could think we can get cheaper debt right now. So that that tells you what type of environment we're in right now. Like, hey, getting better terms potentially. Um, I left, you know, there's there's 3.7 billion, 1.2 billion for debt debt repayment, or this is the debt swap, you know, you raise 1.3, but 1.2 billion debt repayment. Um, you get about another billion dollars for balance sheet and expenses. That leaves $1.5 billion gap. What is that gap? And the reality is the sh existing shareholders are getting a payday. They're, they're, they're getting to either sell their shares or, or getting some sort of payday. That also was something that wasn't clearly articulated in the presentation. That sort of rubs me the wrong way. I don't know. Um, you know, Feel free to leave a comment below if you disagree with me. But that I like if, if, if there's billions of dollars moving around, I like to know what's exactly going on with it versus this sort of nebulous sources and uses. I, I feel like this could have been much clearer. Um, let's keep going. So what's the deal? What's actually going on? So you could see like this debt is getting repaid. This is the eight and a half percent debt and it's getting swapped out for this 1.3 billion at six and a half percent. That's that's this is what the conditions are. You know, they're hoping that it'll be due in 2027. And then they're like, look, the debt the debt load is actually really good because the debt load's only four times EBITDA. First of all, that's a lot of debt. That's the type of debt I would expect from like a cable company. Um, you know, this is this is a levered balance sheet. You know, when you when you have two times debt, that's like that's that's like healthy private equity. When you start talking about returns like three, four, five, six, now you're talking about equity types of returns that you should be expecting from from that debt. And in a bankruptcy type of situation, when you have those levels of terms of debt, you know, four or five, six times in that type of bankruptcy situation, I'm not saying that's going to happen, but I'm saying it's something that you should store in the back of your mind. When you see those levels of debt, generally equity levels, equity shareholders, which are always below in, in how you rank in, in bankruptcy, like debt, debt, maybe preferred stock, then common shareholders. So that's, you know, you and me buying these shares. You generally get wiped out in bankruptcy when you have this this level of of debt. Now you'd make some sort of comparison and say like, hey, I think the business could support this level of debt. We'll get to that, you know, potentially later. But they're like, oh man, the opco level debt 
is only four times. I I think it's just a bunch of baloney that they call that out even. It's it's sort of frustrating because the real debt load is six times, which is like now you're definitely you are you are at full like you need this business to be stable year in, year out, if you're gonna be levered like all the way up to here. Um there are some some aspects to this where they go, well, wait a second, you should only look at four times debt because this 1.3 billion is convertible into stock. Okay, like maybe. But what you need to understand as a shareholder, like, look, I'm trying to balance the scales here so everyday investors can understand the game being played. And you know, that 1.3 billion convertible, it converts into 100 million shares. Let that sink in. 100 million shares. This is versus a stock that only has like 650 million or excuse me, 675 million shares outstanding. So that's 15% dilution. That as that's a big weight. Like, ugh. Anytime the stock price is going to hit 13, you're going to have this 15% overhang that can potentially hold down the stock. And so that's that's just something for sh you know potential shareholders to understand. I've talked about the deal. As you can tell, I'm not like, oh man, this is super sexy. I'm like, oh my gosh, this there's all these moving parts like this. This has lipstick on the pig all over it. Like when, I, when I'm seeing this. So so what is multi-plan? Like, let's actually dig into what is the company that that's merging with Churchill. So multi-plan integrates with insurance companies to lower their expenses effectively by pushing back on claims. Um, what? So you can see the 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 diagram of what what happens. You have 60 million plus consumers. They, they go to their, their doctors and nurses, which are 1.2 million providers. These 1.2 million providers send claims to these payers. Um, and so you get you get all these claims, you know, and so you, you have, let's say, 135 million claims that were effectively submitted by these doctors and nurses to these health insurance plans. These these plans, they're the top 10 of 10, top 10 of 10 in the United States um are customers of multiplan so you need to understand that this means you have someone that's like owning this market of getting savings for the largest insurance companies in the united states it says united the largest u.s healthcare company is one of many of the top payer customers who multiplan has been continuously serving for decades so there's a lot of data here to to extrapolate like anthem united healthcare these are the big brands it does make me think like hey do you have any customer concentration risk because you know, the way the market's skewed is it's not like you have a thousand different pairs that each have, you know, 0.1% market share. You have a couple players that each have, you know, 10, 20% market share. Do you have that level of revenue concentration? Because I didn't see anything in the presentation, but it's a presentation. You know, they, they don't have to call out that, that, that same type of risk that you'd get with an IPO file. That said, you know, when they call out, they've been with these customers for decades you should think value proposition. You should be thinking they must have a solid value proposition in order to stick around for decades. That means they're doing a real solid for these customers. And that's that's where going back to this diagram is like, oh, okay, so 135 million claims goes to these folks over here. The claims all in are for $106 billion. Then this is where, bam, multi-plan gets involved. They have their intelligence you know, engine. They have their network of seeing like, hey, this is how much we generally pay for these claims or these codes are generally not tied to these codes or you know what it's strange for this person to be billing for this when we've seen this they've got their whole algorithm and they're like wait a second this doesn't make sense push it back so what was supposed to be 106 billion dollars in claims we're gonna get 19 billion dollars in savings for these customers okay so that's that's what they're saying they're saying you submit 106 billion dollars we're going to figure out what the problems are. What are the errors? Where are they wrongly? Like maybe there's fraud even like what, what, what? Maybe they put in the wrong code and they shouldn't even be billing for that. They're saving customers like 20 cents on the dollar. Big deal when you're talking about companies that only have, you know, let's say 10, 20% operating margins. That's a big deal. So how does this translate into a business model for multi-plan? So more savings, more revenue. That's how it works. And they break it down like this. So 135 million claims times 100 times $800 average dollar value of claim process. So $800, the average value of the claim times by 135 million claims gets to around $100 billion. Drives me a little kooky dukes that on here they're saying $100 billion. On this slide, they're saying $106 billion. Whatever, more lipstick. Um, so $100 billion 
Then they say the number of claims where you could get potential savings is 45%. All right, so that's $45 billion of potential claims that might have some sort of savings, of which they think they can get, of those, of those 45 billion, they think they can get 42% is, is potential savings on that. So that gets to $19 billion. Average percentage of savings generated for a customer on claims process that contain near 42% savings. Like that means you 45% of their billings, nearly half of the billings for these payers. They're like, you way over bill of like, we're gonna give you 60 cents on the dollar. That's that's really what they're saying here, like, which is pretty incredible. Then they say the percentage share multi-plan earns from savings generated for customers varies by contract. This is the part where it's like, Either do you take me as an idiot? Like that's that's what what it makes me wonder. Cause like you tell me what the revenue is and you tell me what your savings is. Like, why why can't you just say it's a range of around five percent? Or or are you misleading us with this nineteen billion dollar savings figure? Like that's that's what I'm trying to figure out. Like revenue, yeah, we can confidently pencil out around a billion dollars. Like you're telling us savings is nineteen billion. Why can't you say the percentage that multiplan earns? Another another way of like slowly getting giving me a, a twitch with this one. Um, like what what what's the deal with this company? Why why do they keep digging? You know, weird ways. So I, I think it's just ridiculous. They 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 don't say like five percent. Nevertheless, what's the company's history? What's Multiplan's history? And it's interesting. Like here, let me shrink down a little bit. So you can see that the company has gone from one billion in two thousand six to three billion in twenty ten. 4.4 billion in 2014, you know, and it's it's effectively gone up 10x since 20, 2006. And they say like, hey, here are some acquisitions we made along the way that made this possible. Not huge acquisitions, 50 million, 50 million. They don't say how much this is, but I feel like they should tell us. So, and so they've gone from Carlisle, Silver Lake, Star Partners Group, Hellman and Freeman to Churchill Capital. When I see this, I'm thinking to myself like, wait a second. This is just going from one private equity fund to another, like dress up a pig, put on some lipstick, pass it on, get a higher valuation, pay down some debt, pass it on, pass it on, pass it on, pay down some debt, pass it on. Like, so I see this company where you keep on adding levels of debt as, as you get it to grow. Um, and so what it, it concerns me, like this is, this is a red flag because this means you're dealing with mercenaries. You're not dealing with missionaries. You're not dealing with someone that wants to change the world and revolutionize a marketplace where they say, hey, we have a product that's truly better than that. We, we have a product that's unrivaled, better than the rest of the marketplace. And that's why we're going to win. You know, I, I did a, I, I did a video on Lemonade, ticker LMND. And it's about a company that's revolutionizing, you know, homeowners insurance. That is a big deal. They're, they're, they're dramatically lowering the costs. And you can just every... Every ounce of reading their filing, watching their videos, you get the sense that they are missionaries. They have this missionary zeal to change an industry, to change the insurance industry with, with recognizing like, hey, there's a better way to do this. When I see private equity funds, I go, ah, that's, that's some serious financial engineering that you're dealing with. You got one private equity fund passing into another. These are all mercenaries. They want to, they're figuring out ways like how much debt can we load up this company? Like, Put on more debt. How much money can we suck out of this? You know this 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 company. Um, what what sort of deals can we get out of this? You know what? You know let let's keep going because you'll see what I mean in a second. What else? So here's here's where it gets a little interesting. So in 2014, they were valued at 4.4 billion, which based on 612 million is around seven times EBITDA. So now they're they're saying 850 million in EBITDA for 2021. EBITDA is is a proxy of cash flow. It's a it's a poor proxy, but let's just we can save that for I can create an exclusive content video for journey subscribers that want to learn about it. Um so it, it's a proxy for cash flow. And now in 2021 or 2020, they're saying 850 million in EBITDA. This deal is valuing multi-plan around 11 billion dollars. So you're going from seven times to 12 to 13 times. So well over 50% multiple expansion just since 2014. So that's that's something that you should know. This is like a hot potato and like, hey, we got a good deal and you're going to be paying up for it. Um, and also it's it's you're you're getting you're paying up for it. And 
the growth rate really isn't that crazy. Like, you know, you're talking about 8% over several years, 13% over several years. I'm not in love with this setup. Like, it's a relatively slow growth company. And, I mean, you could say like, well, wait a second, 13% is pretty good. Well, how much of that is just cutting costs? Like, I don't know how much leverage you can get out of this. Like, this company's already at like 80% gross mar gross EBITDA margins. So, you know, 80% EBITDA margins. So, like, I'm thinking to myself, you know, what if this 13% was just juiced up from cutting costs? What if your long-term growth rate's tied to this? And how much of this 8% was because you were making these deals? Of these deals, how much were these two? And was in material amount? How come you're not telling me what the size of these deals were? But these two deals, you're telling me they're each fifty million a piece. That's what I'm wondering. I'm like, okay, like clearly you had had some pretty sizable growth here. Um, was was some of this growth due to these deals? And you know, is that is that part of the reason why this company has? Why does this company have so much debt in the first place? Like, this is just a question. Like, you're gonna say, well, it's a it's a super stable company. You have contracts that go out years. Why not? You know, pay out. Why not optimize the capital structure? Okay, so like I see this, I'm thinking like I'm not super excited because 8% organic, 8% growth, which is probably getting a couple percent from mergers or acquisitions, like means your organic growth is single digits, low single digits at best. That's what I'm thinking. So that's what's driving your growth. And do you really have the balance sheet to do further acquisitions in the future? Because as I, as I pointed out at the beginning, you're pretty levered, like you're... I, I don't know the ratings on these bonds. I should have looked them up, but you know this 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 might be just steps away from being junk rated. In which case, you own you own bonds that are you know below investment grade. So I I don't know. Like I in this, in this crazy environment, six times leverage. Maybe maybe it's even not rated junk junk. I don't know. But that's when you go like, okay, but these these are private equity folks, Daniel. Um, and keep in mind, I actually used to work you know on the private equity industry where we were doing roll-ups, but we were paying four to five times EBITDA. So like, I recognize how, how expensive things are. This, this deal is literally 3X the multiples that we were getting on a much smaller basis on a equally sticky industry. So that's, that's just something to, to understand. Um, okay, but these, but these private equity folks are super smart. There must be a lot of upside and you know, potentially a lot, you know, potentially, potentially, you know, like, they're saying in their in their base case, their LBO case, they're going to get 7% EBITDA growth. And then in their strategic plan, they might be able to get 10 to 13% growth because they're going to take their ability to crush costs, you know, save customers 20 cents on the dollar by tapping into areas like government, you know, property and casualty insurance. You know, when you have a claims, maybe you, maybe you can be pushing back on claims, dental auto insurance. So there's a lot of areas where it's like, hey, maybe you can punch back on claims and save some customers money, create this model that's very similar and help juice their growth over turn, you know, over, over the next few years. I'd say like, this is interesting. Like, let's, let's see what this implies. So like 10 to 13% growth in EBITDA. Okay. So that means fundamental growth annualized of 10 to 13% a year, like automatically you're doing above average market. And generally the S&P over like 50 years, it's around 8%. So this is good, 10 to 13%. Plus, they're going to have some cash flow. Now, despite how levered this thing is, they're, they're still probably going to generate, you know, they in their sheet, in their in their presentation, say around 500 million in levered free cash flow. So 500 million on $11 billion valuation. So, you know, they're, they're probably going to repay debt. You know, your value to the equity is going to increase by 4 to 5% a year, maybe more than that because of leverage, maybe maybe 6% a year, you know, the business is growing. So now you're looking at, you know, potentially, you know, seeing seeing what these annualized rate adds up to, you know, maybe you're penciling out to five years from now, 100, 150% upside. And then it's like, whoa, what if, what if people get even crazier and like valuation multiples expand? Now keep in mind, you know, 2014, 2015, it was seven times. Now it's 12, 13 times. What if maybe it's 15 times? Like, hey, what if people get excited? It's 18 times. Now you're talking like, 200% return five years from now. And that's, that's, this is the type of stuff that bankers are like, yeah, I'm making my Excel speak. This is awesome. Making my Excel dance. Um, and so I, I see this and I'm like, okay, I can see what's getting the bankers excited. Like, yeah, 150% upside potentially. That's, that's sort of what they're saying. What are my initial thoughts though? Like I'm thinking they're not revolutionizing hair, health. 
They're helping insurance companies keep up their margins by effectively telling the doctors and nurses like, we're only going to pay you back 60 cents on the dollar because we flagged this claim as one of the claims that's a problem. So you're only going to get 60 cents on the dollar. So I wonder, like, is that a, does that keep costs down or does that actually push costs up? Like I wrote by proxy keeping costs down. But as I was thinking about, like, maybe this actually leads to price inflation over time because you're going to have more and more doctors being like, oh, man, we keep getting pushed back. We keep only getting 60 cents on the dollar. You know, maybe we just need a bill for more stuff. Um, do more sort of peripheral services and that's that actually leads to price inflation over time so maybe maybe you have that going on like i i don't know if this actually keeps costs down in the system um what type of deal is this multi-plan is like just perfect private equity fodder it's a like super stable business maybe it grows a couple percent a year really high margins you know relatively asset light so you can borrow a lot of money against the business um, you know, against against this really stable cash flow. And, you know, the more stable it is, the more you can borrow. So like, mouth is drooling, the finan that financial engineering's cooking. And so, you know, this is just perfect private equity fodder, like multi-decade deals, and I can I can get a I can get a loan for 90% of this company structured at six percent, and maybe the company grows at six percent a year. Like I'm just gonna make bank. That's how the private equity industry works. So I, I see this also on the debt side, like, look, this is a traditional LBO type deal, like private equity type deal where you're going to be levered to the gills. You know, you're levered all the way up here. You know, if Buffett, Warren Buffett once described, you know, leverage as driving around with a, a, a dagger stuck on the steering wheel. So that way, if you ever have a bump, you know, you get impaled. And, and that's, you know, I, that's the reason why I'm not super attracted to having a lot of debt, either with companies or my personal life. Um, don't ask me about buying a home. And so, you know, I, I don't like, you know, being in a situation where it's like, yeah, everything just has to work perfectly. Like none of their customers can leave. Yeah, I know it's been multi-year relationships, but like, I don't know if something happens in the future because you're levered all the way up to here. Um, and I also don't like that. I feel like they just aren't straight with me in the presentation. I feel like a lot of things are just glossed over, like how they're, or, or, or they're trying to spin it in a way that, just feels a little too much um like pitching the opco debt versus looking at consolidated like dude if if the company gets in trouble what's what's at the operating subsidiary doesn't matter like you're going to be toast if if the company gets in trouble like your, your consolidated debt is what's going to get you in trouble um you know they they didn't i don't think in the presentation they once talked about their refinancing uh how they're actually refinancing their debt they're not in, in their shares outstanding. They don't actually include any of the sponsors equity um, in terms of the management grants. Like they get like 1% of the company effectively for free. You know, maybe they pay, maybe, maybe the exercise price is like 12 bucks or something. And, and they just, you know, it's a, it's a de minimis price. You know, like I look at this and I'm just like, I would love a revolution in healthcare. I would love to see lower costs and better care. But it will need to be driven by new companies, not companies that are enabling the existing system that's currently 20% of our GDP. It's like a tapeworm in our system. And so every year it just grows a little faster than GDP. And I see this company and I'm thinking, I'm not so sure you're actually helping the problem. You know, because I, I understand, yeah, you're keeping your you're helping your clients make sure that they're not they're not paying all the bills they have to. But by secondary effect, is it actually resulting in, in doctors and nurses actually billing for even more? That's, that's one qu question I have. You know, I, you need to have new companies. You need to have consumer transparency. That's the best way. People know how to pay for things. People know that a burger at In-N-Out is going to be a great deal. You know that you're going to get your double-double, your fries and your milkshake, and it's going to be like $10 or less versus going to, you know, special Jiffy's burger house where each burger costs $20 and it's not nearly as good. Like you need transparency and you don't have that in the healthcare sector with exception to a few companies. There are a few companies that are trying to revolutionize certain verticals in the healthcare space. I've talked about one fairly recently. And you know, those are the companies that are, are disrupting and I think could create unrivaled value proposition, long-term tremendous growth. Um, and you're going to need societal buy-in where people say like, this system isn't working. Like, 
why do I need to have insurance? Why does insurance need to be tied to employment? Um, so why why are all these questions like Daniel, like you're going way off track here? This what's this have to do with multi-plan? The reason why this is important is because at some point, what can't go on forever won't. And so at some point, the system will change. The system can't keep growing faster than GDP, becoming a larger and larger percentage of the economy. And when the change comes, I don't want to own a heavily leveraged, heavily, heavily indebted private equity deal that's effectively run by a bunch of miss missionaries, um, excuse me, run by a bunch of mercenaries, not missionaries, um, with potential customer concentration risks. Once again, I got a presentation on S1, so I don't know how concentrated their revenue is, even though they've got 10 of the 10 largest payers in the United States. I don't know how much their revenue is concentrated. So I'm thinking like someday, it might not be in the next five years, but someday the system will change and potentially dramatically. And I don't want to own the company that's that like that like that dagger on the steering wheel, the proverbial steering wheel. I don't want to get impaled because we were just running at full leverage and we hit a hit otherwise a bump. Um, maybe the change comes from tech. Maybe an AI focused company can do what Multiplan does for one percent of the cost. I don't know. Maybe there's something with a 10x improvement. Or maybe it's legislative, where they say like, "Hey, healthcare for all." I don't know. Um, and and then you you completely disrupt the existing model. Um, maybe it's interest rates. You know, like that's that's a completely outside of the business model, where like if interest rates go up a lot, you still have all this debt, then your valuation is going to get crushed because you're not going to have any cash flow to service that debt if interest rates were to move much higher. Now keep in mind, like their debt is fixed, so it's not an issue. Um, but they would have to refinance that debt at some point. So it's not an issue for now, probably not an issue for the next five years. Um, these are things that like, I, I try to take a multi-year focus when I'm looking at companies. Um, or maybe you just get an amazing return. Maybe I'm being too skeptical. So it's a pass for me. That said, if you want to see what I am buying, you know, what are those potential multi-baggers that I am buying, go to unrivaledinvesting.com, click on Journey. And I'll remember, all it takes in your personal journey is all it takes is finding one, a couple of potential multi-baggers to change your journey. So if you want to follow my journey as I try to find these multi-baggers, go to unrivaledinvesting.com, click journey. Also, there I post exclusive content each week. And once again, you can see my portfolio, what I buy, what I sell, what I hold. I'm trying to find these companies with unrivaled value propositions and 10x potential. When you're unrivaled, it means you have a good or a service that you simply can't get elsewhere. And it means it gives you generally that right to work. So if you enjoyed this video, which I hope you did, talking about Churchill Capital, Multiplan, SPACs, please make a point of subscribing. If you're already a subscriber, hit that thumbs up button. Thank you so much for watching.